afternoon over to Dick Preston, or I should say Dr. Richard Preston. You're the fourth or sixth or tenth or something, I believe. Dick is a professor emeritus of anthropology at McMaster University, but he's not one of those academics who does things academically all the time. He lived among the Cree for many years, and in fact told me a few years ago that sometime during their lives, each of their cho his children, of which he has four, thought they were Cree. Five, 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 and I, <laughs> um, each of them thought they were Cree. They didn't know they weren't. Um, so that's not distant um, scholarship by any means. Uh, I know some things about Dick, but not as much as I would like to, and I think that it's best to have Dick have his story, so please welcome him. Expenses. 
And so I signed up. I could spell TP two or three ways, and that was about all I knew about James <laughs> Bay. And uh, the other thing that uh, went along with that was you got to have a research proposal. Now, consider the intellectual side of this. Why would you expect a person to write a research proposal when he knew nothing about where he was going? <laughs> Not really a great plan. Okay. So I had to come up with something, uh, and uh, this is more or less standard in anthropology, I think. I thought to myself, oh, okay, James Bay Fur Trade, Hudson's Bay Company, 300 years of mercantile capitalism, those Indians must be really socially disorganized. So I wrote a proposal on social disorganization, and off I went. And I got there, and I couldn't find any. There was a problem. <laughs> and uh, there were 12 non-native people in that community of 500, and they were pretty socially disorganized, but I wasn't supposed to study them. <laughs> I just irritated them by uh, not living with them and uh, causing them, I suppose, at some level to ask themselves why they were so separate from everybody else in the community. So uh, early on in that summer, we got uh, the services of a young fellow who actually had spent uh, several years in Hamilton uh, in the TB sanitarium, which is now Shadok Hospital. And so Willie was fluently bilingual and bicultural. He had the TB of the spine, which gave him a, a limp and a somewhat uh, a fairly small body, but uh, he was no weakling. He was a very intelligent man. He was exactly my age. And uh, so he became, uh, you might say, my interpreter and general manager. He helped me to uh, make my way. And uh, one day he took me to see an old man. And uh, the old man started telling stories about uh, things that he had done in his life. And these tend to be called in academe at least, hardship stories. I don't care much for the label because they tell about deprivation and what I believe those stories tell to the people who made them and who listen to them is coping stories. Uh, if it's just hardship, what's the use? You know, if it's coping, even if they didn't survive, how they coped with their extremity is important to know. There's a morality there that's terribly important. So, coping stories. And uh, old George was pretty good when he was uh, talking, and his wife was just in the next room uh, performing editorial services on his uh, narrative. <laughs> and, uh, he didn't appreciate that a lot. It really is bad form uh, to interrupt a, a storyteller. And uh, on the other hand, he did need a little help on some of these things. The upshot of it was that really decided that since I had done pretty well with George, maybe he would take me to see the person that really knew the stuff. And this was where I lucked up uh, in a, a way that has carried me through the rest of my life. The man that I was taken to see, named John Blacknett, uh, was born about 1896 uh, in the bush. And uh, he had a grandmother. And his grandmother's mother was a grown woman before she ever saw Hudson's Bay Post. So we're talking pretty remote, traditional stuff. And John's grandmother was a storyteller. And John, by temperament, uh, remembered most of the things that he heard, even as a child. Not everything, but John had a phenomenal memory. And I started recording John uh, late in the summer of 63. And I went back for uh, six more summers. One of them, uh, he didn't tell me stories because his wife had died the winter before and he didn't feel like it. But John became my mentor and I became his scribe because people at that time were not too interested 
in the stories. This was uh, radio, record player, lots of country and western, Hank Snow, heard and songs, and, and so on. And so stories were not something that people were too concerned about. You can always get stories, was, I think, pretty much the way they were being thinking about them. Excuse the grammar. Uh, so he was kind of pleased that I was so interested. And uh, he wanted those stories uh, remembered. He was in his late 60s when we started. Uh, he continued to go into the bush until a year or two before he died uh, in his 80s. Uh, so he, he loved the stories because they were a part of his life experience. And uh, it was really what he had built up as uh, his, his equity in life, I guess you could say. And uh, I recall writing down one story to check it out because we had a fellow as a substitute interpreter who didn't do very well. And so I read it back through the interpreter to John, and John would put his finger on the page while I was writing, reading it to him. And when I was finished with that page, he would take his finger off and go to the next page. It's like making your mark. Okay. So it was important to him that I got it right. And uh, so uh, I did collect a lot of stories. Some of those stories got put into uh, curriculum uh, booklets that we uh, made on site. We had a little project there to meet Cree children where they were when they came to school and try to pick up from there. And that was okay, but in 1971, not only did a massive hydro project start, but also the Pentecostal church uh, started. And these stories, being from before people got Jesus, were out of the school. Kind of disappointing. Well, it moderated after five or ten years. In life, you've got to be patient. And uh, thanks to uh, my daughter Susan, who was here, uh, I got a second edition of, of my book put out uh, just a few years ago, and the Cree School Board bought 600 copies. Now, well, the stories are okay again, okay? and even of value. And uh, she also uh, did the uh, technical work on putting together 26 CDs of the stories, which would have both the Cree and the English translation. And uh, those went to the school board. And now, uh, the whole pile, which is about four times that much, I guess, is uh, about due to go on the uh, East Cree website. So that people who want to listen to John's voice, which was a pretty impressive voice, uh, can still do it, even though John has been gone for a long time. And uh, so in that sense, I have returned the stories. And fortunately, it is at a time in of the stories' lives and my life when it's a good time to do that. <laughs> so, very satisfying in that way. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, I think I'm going to tell uh, the one about Big Skunk and Wolverine. Uh, this is a trickster story. And uh, I imagine that we've all heard of trickster, but I would also be willing to hazard a guess that none of us know what trickster really is. Uh, being a kind of a natural man, pre-socialized, and uh, uh, very unpredictable, and uh, still uh, very much present in the world. Uh, Trickster is constantly transforming and surprising people and himself. But in this case, Trickster is a wolverine. And uh, at that time, and this of course is uh, in uh, mythic times with the Ka'atiyukan and, and Cree, Weshketabwe, really, really old. Uh, there weren't any human beings yet. And uh, the animals at that time, uh, many of them were gathered together uh, with the wolverine as their boss because they were afraid of a big skunk. And this skunk's scent glands, which in Cree are called weedwe, and for some perverse reason I prefer to call them that instead of scent glands. Uh, the skunk's weedwe was so powerful that if he got you, you'd die. That's it. Very, very powerful. And they had more power than that. The weedwe knew 
somehow if somebody crossed the trail of the big skunk, even if it was way back on the trail, and it would quiver, the weed weed would quiver, the skunk would get mad right away. If the person was a long ways away, it would just be a little quiver. Even then, the skunk would turn around and go back and find this person and try to kill them. So the people, as I said, uh, were gathered together under the leadership of Wolverine, who was a trickster. And uh, so Wolverine instructs his little brothers, as he called them, never, never cross the trail of the big skunk, or we'll all be killed. And uh, as it happens, uh, one of the animals, uh, Martin, had a particular curiosity about what that track might look like. And so he thought if he approached the path but didn't cross it, and then burrowed down into the snow. And then he could come up right next to the tracks and look at them and then like that. Now again, well, you know what happened. Right away, the weed we quivered, the skunk turned around and started for them. Well, Wolverine had uh, what we might call a guardian spirit. And uh, he could conjure and his uh, guardian spirit would give him information uh, over distances. And uh, so that night, when he conjured, his uh, Stavio, they call him a big man, told him that the skunk was mad, the skunk was heading for them, and uh, they were in for it. And, uh, so the first thing Wolverine did was to get kind of mad about this, and so he asked, who crossed Skunk's trail. Martin didn't want to be embarrassed publicly, and so he didn't say anything. And Wolverine didn't want to let this go, and so he went round to each person in the tent. Did you, did you, did you? And when he came to Martin, uh, Martin figured that they really couldn't face that one down, and so he admitted it. Okay, well, then what the Mustave have told me is true. We've got to get out of here fast. And so early the next morning, they packed up their tent coverings set off uh, to try to escape the big skunk. And uh, they were headed for James Bay uh, from inland. And they traveled fast, and they traveled hard, and they traveled long. Late that night, they stopped, made their tent, and uh, Wolverine conjured again. And uh, the Mishtabio told him, the skunk is gaining on you. And the next morning, they were off again, and uh, that night, uh, this would be the third night after the event, uh, the Stavio told Wolverine, he's going to catch up to you tomorrow. And uh, so they traveled on, but when Wolverine felt that the skunk was getting close, I don't know if he could hear it or not, he said, okay, little brothers, take your spears and hide behind the trees here. I'm going to dig a hole, and I'm going to get down in the hole, and I'm going to try to grab the skunk. And when I grab the skunk, you come out with your spears and do your best to kill him. So the Wolverine made himself a trap, made himself into a trap. And uh, so he was crouching down, pretty soon here comes the skunk. Okay. And the skunk knew what was going on as far as this was where the trail ended. And the snow seemed to have been disturbed there, and so he stopped. He said, why are you running from me? And the wolverine said, because of your weed weed that we have to run from you. We're afraid of being killed. And the skunk appealed then to his protocol. He said, uh, well, why don't you look at me when you speak to me? What could he do? So the wolverine stuck his head up. But he had planned ahead. He was not only going to stick his head up, but as his head appeared, the skunk, of course, whirled around, raised his tail, and Wolverine leapt and bit him. You know where. And he said, I got him. And uh, then he said, Come out, little brothers. And so all the little brothers came out. They didn't have bows and arrows yet. They took their spears and uh, they went to work uh, spearing the skunk. And Wolverine was hanging on, and the skunk was thrashing around, and Wolverine was flying, but 
He didn't let go of Wolverine's had very strong jaws. Finally, the skunk fell over. Is he dead yet? <laughs> so they probed him in tender places with their spears, and there was no movement. And uh, so he said, I'm going to let go now. So when he let go, he got just a tiny bit of weed weed in his eyes. Not enough to kill him, but it was enough to blind him. So he said, OK, I've killed the big skunk. I want you to cut him up into little pieces and scatter the pieces around in the bush. And there'll never be big skunks like this again, just little ones. And so they did as they were told. And then he said, I'm going to go down now to James Bay and wash off my face. <laughs> and uh, they said, oh, well, we'll take you. No, no, he said, I'm the one who did this. I'm going myself. It was very tricksterish. And, uh, and so he started off, and he didn't get very far before he bumped into a tree. Who are you, he said. Yash, the tree said, black spruce. And uh, so he went around the black spruce, and went on a little further, bumped into another tree. Another named the trees, and or they named themselves, I guess. And finally, he got down to the alders and the willows, and he knew that he was close to the bay, and he went in and he washed <coughs> off his face. And he began to be able to see again. He was never able to see as well as before, but he could see pretty well. And uh, this is not the end of the story, but it has a kind of an end of the story sound to it. That's why James Bay is salt water. But we're going on. <laughs> uh, and uh, so he quite forgot about uh, his little brothers. And uh, he went on to walking along the coast. And he came to the bleached bones of a whale. And he had an idea. He took a rib bone and he put a piece of babish on the, the two ends, uh, nice and tight, and made the first boat. He made some arrows. And he was going along quite pleased with himself. And he came to some tracks. These tracks were at least as big as the skunk's tracks, but they were different. He thought, whoa, this must be a big animal. And he didn't know, because he'd never seen it before, these were snowshoe tracks. Of course they were big. He thought they were very big people. And so he followed the tracks. And after a while, he came to uh, a campsite with some TVs in it. And all he saw was one little kid about this high. And uh, that didn't seem right to him. And he said, uh, where's your father? And the kid said, oh, they're all out hunting caribou. And uh, Skunk said, OK, well, what have you got here? And Skunk Wolverine said, what have you got here? And uh, so the little boy showed him around. And there was a small teepee. And in it were two <coughs> young, very young wolverines. They were wolverines' children, but he had forgotten about them, too, until just now. And so he spoke to his children and said, well, how are you treated? What do they feed you? Well, they just feed us the livers of caribou. And uh, wolverine didn't think that was suitable at all. And so he got quite angry. And he set off uh, on the trail after the hunters. And he came to a place where there was a pretty good sized tree with a limb that went over the trail. And so he climbed up the tree and came out on the limb. Wolverines do this. They like to jump on large game in that way. But he had a bow and arrow. So as the hunting group leader was coming back first, pulling his toboggan with caribou, Wolverine took his bow and arrow, shot him, killed him, jumped down, pulled the man off the trail, and then went back uh, to near where the people were camped to see what would happen. The people found their leader and they were very upset. They decided they had to do something to get rid of the wolverine. But because he was so strong, they had to fool him. They had to be cunning. Now this is a problem with trickster. Okay? Uh, and so they announced that they were going to have a feast. And everybody, of course, is invited to a feast. And so they invited the Wolverine. And the Wolverine, of course, accepted to come. And uh, they said, what we're going to do, we're going to heat up some caribou fat in a bowl, wooden bowl. And we'll pass it around. And when it comes to Wolverine, 
we're going to hit the bottom of the bowl and drive that hot grease into his face, and it'll make him blind. Well, Wolverine's Mustavio told him that's what's going to happen. And so Wolverine went along with the feast, and when the bowl came to him, instead of tipping it up like this to drink it, he tipped it up that way and threw it into the fire and jumped down, saying, I think you're trying to kill me, and he went out. Well, he'd been a little more cunning than they were, and so they were surprised, but they had a limited repertoire, and so they invited him, <laughs> invited him to another feast. And, uh, and we're going to try to do this a little differently. They said, we're going to uh, have uh, some uh, caribou blood uh, in a bowl, and we'll pass that around, and finally we'll get to Wolverine. And uh, so Wolverine uh, was waiting patiently, and when it came to him again, second time into the fire it went, he jumped down. And so, amazingly, they called a third feast. <laughs> and at this time, they were going to take a flat piece of frozen caribou grease and throw it into the bowl when it got to Wolverine, and that way he couldn't spill it into the fire. And uh, Stavio told him this was what was going to happen, and so he went along. And he hopped up in his place and said, my, you're having lots of feasts. And uh, so the bowl started to make its way around. And of course, before they could throw the stuff in, he uh, uh, dipped the bowl into the fire. And he ran out saying, look out for my children. And he went into the bush. And there he stayed and stays. Well, the problem was that Wolverine had done some things that really offended his guardian spirit. The guardian spirit said, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have killed that man. And because of that, I'm going to go and stay with humans. You're going to lose me. And Wolverine shrugged it off, being a trickster. Who cares? And but he could make his way perfectly well without him and has more or less uh, sense. And that's how humans came to have guardian spirits. And that was, as we'd say, the first human community. OK, that's the end of that.
to hold. And uh, uh, then uh, you can go outside. Well, she was pregnant with a second child. She went out, and uh, pretty soon, sure enough, here came uh, something that we would say, uh, maybe you know we to go, but this is like a Sasquatch with a bad appetite. <laughs> and uh, so here came this very big, very strong, very ugly, and not well-mannered creature. And uh, so she quickly grabbed up her son and put him in the, the bows inside the tent, gave him the awl, went back outside uh, to a fire that she had outside and started doing something industrious. And uh, Louis de Go came and immediately just took his spear and killed the woman. This Louis de Go had a little boy with him. And uh, so the little boy was watching how you do what you do. And uh, the father then cut the woman open in a way which traditional Crees still do with the first uh, animal that kill of the season. Instead of slitting them down and, and uh, skinning from there, cut them down uh, this way. I don't know why people do that, but it's a tradition. When that happened, the baby, who was not injured, fell out on the ground. About that time, the little Wedego had gone inside the tent to see what was there, anything interesting. And uh, so he was looking to see what was hidden behind the boughs because that's where interesting things are kept. And he got around finally to where the little boy was, he opened the boughs, and here was the little boy. And the Wedego boy stuck his head out like that. The little boy went like that with his all and gave him a bloody nose. And so the Wedego boy ran outside bawling, have a no sleep. And uh, his father said, yeah, don't bother me, I'm busy. And uh, so uh, they had their, their meal off of the unfortunate uh, wife and left. Immediately they left, some mice came. And several of them together picked up the infant and carried it away. Now, this was out of the eyesight of the little boy with the awl who was scared stiff and who was still where he'd been put. And his father came home and he found uh, the ruin of his, uh, of his family. And he thought, but maybe she remembered what I said. And so he went inside the tent and he found his son. It's great to be. So he packed up his things and took his son and they went to a place that had uh, not such bad memories. And they made their living. Meanwhile, the mice, who had a very small TV, <laughs> kept the infant, <laughs> kept the infant, and uh, would feed it. And uh, uh, the infant didn't seem to be uh, interested in all the same things that the mice ate. And so they would steal a little bit of food from the man and bring it back and uh, feed it to the infant and the infant prospered. And uh, they had to enlarge their TV. <laughs> and uh, the infant wanted to play outside. And so. This is a younger brother who was never born naturally. That's the Cree name for the story. And it is a key to what happens later. Never born naturally. So they fed the boy. They nurtured the boy. Uh, they made toys for the boy. And uh, the boy would uh, go out and uh, shoot a little bow and arrow that they made for him. He would lose his arrows. And uh, meanwhile, his older brother, who didn't know about this, also had toys, bow and arrow. He would lose his arrows. And so they would wander looking for the arrows that they lost. And one day, the older brother found the younger brother. He was astonished. And uh, so the younger brother explained that basically was living with these mice and he was really glad to see that he had a brother and wanted to be able to play with his brother and he would ask the mice if that was okay and uh, so at first the mice said well your older brother can come and play with you here around the tent but he has to go home before his father comes back in the evening okay 
And uh, so that's what they did. But then it got kind of boring because the mice had such a small place. And uh, those kids kept that way. And so the younger brother asked the mice, can I go and play with my older brother around his father's TV? The mice were a little worried about this, but they said, well, when the father comes home, he's going to see not just his own son's tracks in the snow, he's going to see two sets of tracks, his son's, and then these little tracks. And he's going to say, who is this? And that's when the older brother is going to have to say, oh, it was just walking on my heels. <laughs> that's a lie. Starts a chain of events. So that's what they did. And for some time, uh, they uh, played together and they had a really good time. And they grew. And finally, I don't know how old that younger brother was, but he was uh, pretty mobile and pretty capable. And so the mice decided he was old enough now so that he could stay with his older brother all the time, even though the father was away all the time and couldn't look after them the way the mice could look after this, this youngster. And so uh, you can go now and live with your older brother and your father and tell them the story of how this happened. And so they did. And the father was really not very touched that the mice would take the trouble and be so nurturant and so on. And so he took some of the best food that he had saved and said, you know, take this to the mice and thank them. And of course, ever since that time, mice have had a little bit of the food of humans as a continuing payment. And so the boys lived together and they grew to adulthood. And uh, they noticed that their father always went off in the same direction in the morning. And they wondered where he went. And uh, they were roaming further and further from the tent now. And their father told them, you can go around, don't get lost, but never go down my trail. They didn't know it, but the father had found a lynx woman. So he had another tent and another family. And uh, so, of course, being boys, they could only take that advice for so long. <laughs> and, uh, they had to follow the path. And uh, so when they got there, they didn't know who this lynx woman was. They didn't know who the little lynx were. And so they had their bows and arrows, and so they shot them. And they were very pleased because this was their first significant hunting experience. And so they took one of the little lynxes back with them and put it on a plate with a piece of caribou skin over it. And they said, when our father comes back, he'll be so proud of us. So the father came back and they said, Father, look what we've done. The man burst into tears and turned around and ran back down that path. Now, a grown man would cry only at the death of a very close relative in this case, his wife. And they knew that. And so they said, I guess we have killed our stepmother and our cousins. I guess now our father is going to kill us. And so it escalates. They take their bows and arrows and they go out expecting their father. Oh, louder, thank you. Escalate. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So they took their bows and arrows and uh, waited on the trail for their father to come. They could see his anger. And so, to save themselves, they shot and killed their father. What are we going to do now, the younger brother said. Well, we'll just have to get a living by ourselves, said the older brother. So they put the tent coverings and the other things on the toboggan. And they left that place because it had such bad memories and they went on some distance for some time. Well, at this point, uh, they were both past puberty, one of them a few years past, and uh, the older brother, uh, thinking on these things, said that he was going to find a wife for himself, and uh, he wasn't going to have a wife like uh, the lynx woman, he was going to have a wife from humans. Now, the younger brother had never seen a human. 
he said, don't bother looking for me. He said, I'm not going to do that. And the uh, younger brothers. So they went on, and finally they came to a teepee, and, and here were two nice young women in there, unattached. And uh, so they were invited in. They had a nice meal. And, and uh, then it was getting now time to uh, go to bed, and so uh, the two sisters uh, both were interested in the older brother, but one of them said, well, why should we share this older brother when there's a nice younger brother here? I'm going to sleep with him. And uh, the younger brother said, well, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm leaving. And so he packed up his stuff, <laughs> and away he went. And uh, so he was gone for hmm, some little distance and some little time. And he got to thinking, it's awfully lonely. He's always been living with somebody, whether it was mice or his brother, <laughs> after all. And uh, so he thought, it, it would be nice to have a wife, but I don't want one of those humans. <laughs> and uh, so he started looking and wishing, deeply wishing. And so he came to a beaver pond, and here was a beaver woman. Now, she didn't look quite like beavers do now. Her teeth were not orange, they were black. And her hair was not nicely roomed out. It was all matted, so she didn't really look that great. <laughs> and, uh, but she was a woman, okay? And so the younger brother, uh, all heedless and eager, said, uh, would you live with me? And she said, well, I'll try it. And so uh, she came out, and uh, he said, okay, well, uh, take the toboggan and, and set up our teepee uh, over there a ways, and I'm going to get us something to eat. And she thought, beaver pond, eat, he's going to kill a beaver. And so she said, I can only eat the meat of a male beaver, not of a female beaver. And so she went off, set up a tent, and he killed a male beaver, came and they prepared the beaver and they ate well and they went to bed, slept together, and in the morning he opened his eyes. First thing he saw were these big black teeth, and this matted hair. Uh, you know, you're pretty nice, but you're not very nice looking. And so I, I can't stay with you. And so he packed up his things, and off he went. And she went crying home to her grandmother. She thought she'd been very poorly, well, she had been very poorly used. And her grandmother said, don't worry, she said, that boy's going to come back to you one day. Just shine your teeth, comb your hair, and, and he's going to come back to you. So the boy went on. Well, uh, we won't hear about all the wives. <laughs> there, there were a, a number. And uh, uh, I, I might mention uh, one of them was a porcupine woman. Now that might seem difficult, but <laughs> porcupines do not have quills everywhere. And, and, and porcupines are industrious. And when she set up the tent, uh, the poles had been completely stripped apart. Oh. Clean, beautiful house. He was very impressed. And when he woke up in the morning and he looked at her, he saw this big black nose. And he thought, hmm. And so he said, well, I, I can't stay with you. Off he went again. After, a, oh yes, the caribou woman, I have to mention that. <laughs> Caribou are sort of the Barbies of the subarctic. <laughs> and uh, so he found a caribou woman, and he said, would you stay with me? And she said, sure. And uh, so uh, she took the toboggan, and the tent was up in a twinkling, and there was smoke rising before he even managed to kill some supper. And uh, so uh, they ate, and uh, just before going to sleep, she had to relieve herself. And when a caribou gets up, a caribou gets up stern first. And it embarrassed. And he thought, what would my friends think if every time my wife gets up? And so he was troubled about this. Okay. But 
not so troubled that they didn't spend the night. And, uh, so in the morning, first thing again, she has to go out and relieve herself. Well, that's it. He said, if you're going to do that every time you get up, I can't stay with you. <laughs> then there was a Whiskey Jack woman, Canada Grey J, and uh, very small, but very neat, very attractive, and uh, very lively. And uh, he was just a younger brother, for goodness sake. And, and uh, so he asked uh, the, the Whiskey Jack uh, woman, she his wife, and she said, well, I'll try it. And uh, so it was dark before the smoke was coming out of the TV because uh, she'd had a terrible time. She tried to pull the toboggan, and she tried very hard to do her part in this, and her legs broke. And so he took a spare bowstring and wound it round her legs, and you can see those ridges still. Okay. And he helped her get the, the toboggan there. So in the morning, he said, well, you know, you're really nice, and you're very attractive, but you're not quite big and strong enough to do the jerk, the, 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 the job, the work. And uh, so I can't stay with you. Well, he'd been making a very big circle, and you can guess where he's coming back. <laughs> and he gets to the beaver pond, and he thinks, sitting on a rock again, wishing, hoping. And he sees this beaver woman, and he thinks, I never should have left her. <laughs> That's what I should have, I should have stayed with her but look how nice she is. And so he asked her, would you come out and be my wife? And she said, on one condition, if ever we come to even a tiny creek, you have to build a bridge across it. Because if I come out of the water to live, I can't go back in the water or I'll stay. And so he argued. So they lived together for some time, and they traveled, and whenever they came to a creek, he would uh, put a log across it. And uh, one day, late in the day, it had been a very hard day, he came to a creek that was so small that it was frozen solid. He thought, well, I don't have to put a log across this. So he didn't bother. He went on and uh, put a marker where his wife should set up the tent, and he went out looking for food, and when he came back, no tent, no light. Uh -oh. So he retraced his steps. And when he got there, it wasn't a small creek, and it wasn't frozen solid. It was a large creek, and it was open water in the middle of the winter. And there was his wife. And he said, I'm really sorry. He said, should have, should have built you a bridge. Would you come back out and, and live with me? No, she said. You promised. So now, if you want to live with me, you're going to have to come and live like beavers. I'll drown, he said. Throw me your mitt, she said. So he threw his mitt, and she caught it in her teeth. She dove down, she came back up, threw it back to him. Beavers had very good hands, up. So she threw it back to him. It was dry. That's the way it will be for you if you'll come and live with me. So he did, and he found that he could breathe underwater. And they lived together. And he said, well, if I'm going to live with beavers, there's going to have to be some changes made. <laughs> in the first place, he said, it's too easy for humans to trap beavers in their houses because there's only one entrance and really need to have more than one way of getting out of the house. So all the beavers started putting multiple exits on their houses. And then he said, it's too easy to break in the roof. So the beaver houses started getting very <coughs> thick, virtually. Not impenetrable, but a hard, hard job to open. The humans, including his older brother, were not pleased with this. And so they did a little pondering, and they found out how this had happened. And the older brother was embarrassed that it was his younger brother, astonished that he would be living uh, with beavers, and angry because he had made life harder for humans. So he determined that he was going to hunt them down. And uh, so they started after the beaver, the beaver husband and wife. By this time, the younger brother 
have begun to develop body hair and some of the features of beavers, very good at swimming. And uh, so he was partially transformed by this lake. When the older brother caught up to them, he started to break in, he blocked the entrances that he could find, he started to break in the roof. And uh, there was still one exit, which uh, the younger brother had very carefully uh, concealed. So they got away and went down the river again towards James Bay. And uh, the older brother was frustrated by this and determined uh, to get his brother. And so he continued to follow them. And he found where they exhausted had stopped in a, another eager house. And this time, uh, he thought he could get them. And he was very careful to look for any exits. Started to break it in the second time. They got away. And so he brought all of his conjuring ability to see where his younger brother was. And the younger brother knew this. And so he took his wife and they hid in an overhanging rock under the water so the older brother couldn't find them. And so the older brother moved off some little distance from where they were. And they came out and they swam like blazes down this river to get to James Bay. It didn't work. The humans got there and uh, this time they barricaded the house. And they left one door open one exit open with the older brother there with his axe. And so as the others were breaking in the house, the younger brother said to his wife, you go first. And so she did. And so she was killed. And so the older brother said, all right, now I've got you. Come out. And so the younger brother climbed out of the house and went off head down uh, with his older brother. And the older brother announced that he was going to have a feast. And the younger brother thought, he's going to try to make me eat the meat of my wife. And so he told his older brother, I can only eat the meat of a male beaver, not a female beaver. If the meat of a female beaver should touch my lips, you'll see what will happen. And of course, this is how things transpired. Everybody came to the feast, food was passed around, and when the younger brother touched the meat to his lips, middle of February, roaring sound, all of the rivers were breaking up in the middle of winter. And people were astonished, and while they were astonished, the younger brother ran out of the tent and jumped into the river and started for the day. His older brother grabbed his spear and went after him. Chased, 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 got closer, closer. But before the older brother could get there, the younger brother got to the bay and swam out. And the older brother took all of his power, conjuring power too, and threw a huge rock. And the rock came and it just missed the younger brother, who by this time looked entirely like a beaver. And so he survived, he lived in the bay, and he got bigger and bigger until he became a the giant beaver. So that's the story. <laughs>
<laughs> he never threw anything away, <laughs> including stories that his grandmother told him. So I was very, very fortunate in that. And very, very fortunate that he wanted these stories to get some permanence. He wanted me to write them down. And uh, uh, later on, when he was uh, in his late 70s or early 80s, uh, a young fellow uh, with a tape recorder and some uh, bad Indian attitude went round to record stories. And John said, well, you know, I've forgotten them all. But Dick Preston has them written down. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, my moment of time. <laughs> She became very exasperated with conversations around the house because our friends were anthropologists and uh, she wasn't. And she finally, in desperation, went to university and wound up living in anthropology just to get into it. <laughs> and uh, when she was working on getting information for her MA, I told John about this. so great. Yes, women kept the tent. Yes, women nurtured the children. Yes, if they were sick, the men could do it. If the men were sick, the women could go out and hunt. There are stories of manly women who didn't need a husband. They could get their living on the land. Now, this is no small matter. I mean, hunting in the subarctic bush takes a pretty capable man. I used to shock first-year audiences by saying, if you want to understand what's going on there, what we could do is we could drop you in the bush with an axe and a 22, and we'll come back in a month. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like when we were asked to show our hands, would we go back for more slaves? Yeah, nobody really would take that kind of offer. Uh, but women could do that. And uh, so they could do each other's work. And a man without a wife was at a huge disadvantage. Okay, A woman without a man, maybe not quite so big. Yeah. <laughs> Not to be cautious anyway. <laughs> yeah. in, in your entire story, the woman is at a, is at a disadvantage oh, yes. throughout. Yes. Uh, maybe abused, yes. uh, disrespected. Yes. He sent her first so that he, knowing that she could right. be killed. Right. Um, how did the women? Uh, the the only thing? thing that excuses that is that he was a younger brother. Yeah. And he had never seen a human being. So, what do you know? Is that similar to animal behavior? Do animals always put themselves ahead of, of uh, their female partner? Where are they taking this tradition? That's a really good question. And I don't know the, I'm reading about beavers right now, actually. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, because beavers, like humans, uh, live in a, a domed TV. They have a space in the back for sleeping, a space in the front for crying off and preparing food. They are very nurturing of their children for about a quarter of their life cycle. Uh, they are, mm, well, I could go on. People get kind of excited about beavers when they say uh, And uh, I was uh, emailing, which I can do now, to a former chief in one of these communities about this and waxing rhapsodic about beavers. And he wrote back and said, yeah, you know, I don't know whether Crees are like beavers or beavers are like Crees. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so it's not an accident that he wound up with a beaver wife. Okay, it was absolutely the best choice. And uh, at the same time, he let her down. Yes. There is some shamanism. Some? <laughs> he was a younger brother. Come on. Uh, you know, his older brother didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, he said this was because he was a younger brother. Yeah. You also said he wasn't 
special work must endow people with certain qualities that he was lacking, or what, what's the significance of not being born naturally? That's why he would not marry a human. That's why he would not learn to do things properly. And uh, that's why he didn't really become mature. He, he was bossy when he went to live with the, the beavers, which a younger brother was mature might be. And, uh, and I don't know the rest of the answer, but that's a part of it. I don't know how mice are in terms of such a vision player, but you know, really it's, it's not a, uh, an idle question. The Crees say that they learn from the animals. It's as part of school. And they don't just learn enough to be able to trap them. They learn how they live. Okay. Yeah? Just a, a comment is that for me, my reaction to the story, it feels like uh, a Shakespearean tragedy in which all of the elements of the tragedy are right there at the beginning and they need to be simply worked out. And uh, so for me, that was the power of the narrative. Yeah, I just mentioned in passing uh, the free playwright Thompson Highway. If you know uh, uh, his plays, once used out loud to my youngest daughter who worked for him for a while, I don't know why not the critics picked up on the fact that I was using Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the rest. Even the names were offshoots of Zeus and Hera and so on. Mm -hmm. on. The lady with the dog. Um, I noticed that one of the uh, the first the bird. You know, you mentioned about the bands around the lake. Yeah. And you mentioned the change in the beaver from the black piece. Right. Holding her hand. And so I kind of thought it was not a creation. Transformation, especially in the very old stories, transformation is a constant. And that's part of the interest of them, because then you find out a little bit about how things got transformed, and even if they're not still that way, which sometimes happens, you can get some sense of what transformation is of uh, other animals. Within that story, I mean. Yeah, I don't remember. And also the beaver, the thing with the logs across the water, too, I was wondering, is that then why beavers chop down? Well, they, yeah, they thickened their house up. They had made their houses from poles before, as did humans, as did mice, and that's uh, But because they didn't make them thick enough, it left them vulnerable, and so he was, he was transforming what beavers do in favor of beavers and for the disadvantage of humans, which is what got him in big trouble. Um, it, it is somewhat removed. Trickster, trickster is cunning, 
and he's always tried to outsmart, but he's always been outsmarted as well. And that cunning part is is, uh, is just one facet, I guess. Is the thing. And a con man would think is a relatively shallow facet of a Christian. But uh, I really recommend Lewis Hyatt's book, Richard Makes This World. It's a wonderful book. Sorry. Thank you. You never knew it would be Well, I don't mind. <laughs> um, two things. One, I, you know, um, students are always asking me about uh, the animal uh, explanatory tales. And Nathaniel Kosky Kapo told my class once that when you see that animal, you remember the story. And the other thing is, is there's still uh, a tradition of only telling these stories in winter? No, uh, that's uh, that's further west. Yeah, that's in Alberta. Yeah. yeah uh, but yeah. In, in the East Coast, uh, people were aware that some people did that. Mm -hmm. But as far as they were concerned, well, in the winter, at night, mm -hmm. you have more time. Mm -hmm. And uh, people aren't going to be doing much else. And so, sure, you could tell a lot of stories, but it's okay to tell them other times mm -hmm. too. It's not going to cause thunderbirds or right. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Now, some places are are much more rule bound, I would say, than than East Coast. Yeah. I think that has survival too, because here, if you gather in the summer when the food is on the things are there to gather, and then in the yeah. Yeah. So it, it can be practical and not just a kind of a rule or a prohibition or something like that. Yeah.
is crucial to hunting, unless you're just littered with animals, uh, in a way that is comparable, in my mind, to being able to focus when you're in graduate school. If you lose your focus, you're out. And if you, so an angry, uh, a grieving, uh, a jealous man makes a poor hunter. And so you do whatever you have to do to clear your mind. A hunting is a spiritual practice. You have to focus your mind, you have to clear your mind, you have to be attentive to being present where you are and, and uh, reading where you can. Yeah. Do you think that John was at all selective in the stories that he told oh, you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he started off with easy ones, fair stories. Not going to go on fair stories. And uh, then he amped it up as he thought I'd be able to appreciate the story. Now, in the story that I told you, the first story, uh, where Wolverine washes his eyes, and I said, this isn't the end of the story, okay? In my relationship with John, it was a 10-year break. I had gone back to John saying, you know what, I'd like to write a book about the, uh, kind of a, a mythic book about the evolution of human community, and, and use this story to start it off. So this was translated to John. But there's a part of that story I didn't tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he picked it up as if he had stopped at a period and was prepared for the next word. And off we went. Yes, but not all. Do you know the CDs we have produced of Louis Bird telling stories? Yes, oh, yeah, I know yeah. Louis. Yeah. Do you know Louis? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I'd also mention, I told a few people, his second book is out now, and, which is an outstanding book in my opinion. And it's called The Spirit is in the Mind. And it's also the Bill Queens. What's the difference? Because <laughs> you know, your story, the animals and the relationship of the animals and the people just reminded me of his stories yeah. very much, you yeah. know. But when we first met, we swapped stories. About yeah. Mm -hmm. He would say, this one nice long, and he's close to school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very nice man. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. storytelling that Dick has done in his life carries on. Um, Carol Lee teaches the Parent Chum of the Goose program in North Hamilton. And as many of you know, Parent Chum of the Goose, there's storytelling. And one of the moms came and she said, oh, storytelling. When I was at the university, I had this wonderful professor who told us stories every time we were in class. And of course, it was Dick. So. Thank you so much, Dick. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, where, do we, does one have to order your book specially, or how does one find uh, a book free narrative? It should be a copy or two in the Mac bookstore. And, uh, you know, chapters had them, but you can go on their online thing and then got it. Thank you. But the second edition <laughs> is much better than the first, and the first was a limited run in 1975, I think, or something like that. That's another great thing about stories. How many professions can you dust off something 20 years old, 25 years old, and put it out again, and it's good? <laughs> Now come to the time for the break, but and so I ask that uh, once you.